Hello, I'm Tony Guida. This is my New York, like a finely wrought soap opera. We left you hanging last week with the question of why Ira Burko thinks the worst sports movie he ever saw was Field of Dreams. We're back with Ira's provocative answer next. It is my pleasure to welcome back to the program Ira Burko, and it's time. They've been hanging for a week. You've seen a lot of sports movies in your time, and Field of Dreams, I mean, you, God, it's universally loved, but you hated it. Well, I, I, uh, I had uh, criticisms of it. Uh, okay. uh, uh, it glamorized and celebrated uh, crooks. You know, I mean, these guys threw the World Series. Right, Shoeless you know, Joe and the rest. Shoeless Joe and uh, Gandil, and, and some were, were, were bad, bad characters. Uh, and, um, uh, and Shoeless Joe, uh, it, first of all, he's not, in the, he's not in the Hall of Fame. He may never get in the Hall of Fame because he admitted to throwing games in the World Series. But if you go to Cooperstown, the, the Hall of Fame, in a glass case is a pair of Shoeless Joe Jackson's baseball shoes. <laughs> <laughs> so he did wear baseball shoes. Right. <laughs> They're a little scuffed even. So uh, you, it, was, it was because of the characters who come into that corner. Yeah, I, I thought so. I thought they you know, glamorizing these, these guys when they didn't have to. Um, and the, uh, the second baseman for the, uh, the, the, the Black Sox of, uh, Chicago of, Black Sox. of 1919 that threw the World Series, these players threw the World Series to the Cincinnati Reds. And the second baseman was Eddie Collins, who did not go along with the gamblers and did not throw the games. And uh, when he was asked about Shoeless Joe Jackson, uh, and people had said Shoeless Joe was illiterate, uh, he w didn't know what he was doing, and it was just some extra money. And, and Eddie Collins said he may not have been able to read or write, but he knew the difference between right and wrong. Mm. And uh, yeah. uh, on the other hand, if you talk about the Hall of Fame, uh, I think that um, uh, Shoeless Joe now, af after how many years, uh, 80, almost uh, 80 years or 90 years, he's paid his dues. There should be, uh, he was one of the great hitters of all time. Uh, he, along with Pete Rose, who's never, even though he gambled on baseball, uh, there's no evidence that he threw games, and he was one of the great players of all time, as was Julius Joe. There should be a plaque up in the, in the Baseball Hall of Fame. Uh, I mean, it's not only a, a, a Boy Scouts Hall of Fame. And to say these were the great players, they made mistakes. Well, there are many questions about the Hall of Fame, and, I, and I'll come right back to it, but I just wanted to ask you, if you have a favorite uh, sports movie, "Bang the Drum Slowly," uh, that is, uh, I, I love it. It's so it was so moving, um, so, you know, beautiful light touches, um, true, and and um, uh, it was uh, from a book, "Bang the Drum Slowly," and a, a it was a sequel to "The Southpaw," yeah, uh, and by Mark Harris, two of the best ba uh, sports books. They're both novels, but beautiful. But Bang the Drum Slowly uh, was the, uh, starring Robert De Niro, yeah. his first starring role. As the, uh, as the catcher, troubled catcher. The catcher dying of uh, cancer. cancer. Yeah. And uh, beautifully done. And Mike, uh, Michael Moriarty uh, was the pitcher. And um, uh, I, I, I could see it endlessly. I, I, the characters of uh, Vincent uh, Gardenia. Vincent Gardenia was yeah. what, the manager? Yeah, the manager. Yeah. Um, it was, uh, it was a marvelous yeah. movie. The it's other uh, baseball movie uh, that I, I loved was Major League. I don't hmm, know if you've ever yeah. seen Major League. Hilarious, hilarious Very movie. Hilarious. Uh, and at one point, um, uh, the, the pitcher's in a little trouble. And so the infielders come in to talk, and the manager comes right. in to talk. <laughs> yeah. And what are they talking about? Well, our, um, our left fielder is going to be getting married in a right. week. 
What should what, we? What should we bring? What should we get them as as yeah, a gift? They're meeting at the mound. They're, they're meeting at the mound, discussing what gift right. they should get the left fielder. Anyway, it's a hilarious movie, and those are two of my favorite. Um, Let's get back to the Hall of Fame and the debate that seems to be in the air more now. Uh, with the, it seems that the catalyst for it uh, is the election of uh, Bud Selig to the Hall of Fame. Bud, the commissioner who. <clears throat> Famously kept his eyes closed during the um, uh, steroid era, not seeing, you know. Uh, so the thought being, if I'm not oversimplifying, that if Selig can get in, then we've got to admit Clemens and we've got to admit Barry Bonds. And I get the sense you may think that perhaps, or I get the sense that you think perhaps they should have been in anyway, but maybe this is the breaking the dam yeah and and again uh they were the the best players of our time and uh and they were great players before there was any suspicion of them doing drugs right uh and uh i mean there there are other guys who uh who probably did uh, did uh, drugs or peds uh performance enhancing uh, drugs uh who maybe were able to get on the team as a 24th or 25th man, if they weren't doing uh, those steroids, they they wouldn't have been on the team at all. But but none of them would have been in the Hall of Fame. Uh, and uh, no matter what Bonds and 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 Clemens did, they were great great players with or without steroids. So again, uh, I don't think that for my purposes the Hall of Fame uh, shouldn't be a, a, a Boy Scouts Hall of Fame. It's just the best players. And um, uh, were they cheating? Um, well, there are statistics. We don't know, you know, how far the cheating went, how much steroids helped. We, we really don't, we still don't know. And so I still think but there I should the be sense. a plaque up uh, on, on a wall saying their achievements and saying um, that there was this evidence that, uh, or suspicions, I guess. No. That, uh, but you're saying even if they did cheat, put them in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. I mean, um, it was just, that's the game. That was the game, you know. Getting back to your book, um, it happens every spring. Um, there's a wonderful piece about attending a game or being in the in the owner's box with the president of the United States, Obama. Yeah, uh, I was invited uh, to uh, Washington, and uh, the White Sox were playing the Washington Nationals. It was just a small group of people in the in the owner's box, and I had access to them for nine innings. And uh, we talked, we chatted. He talked with other people, and uh, but um, uh, he was a he was a delight, and he was a fan. I mean, he 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 knew the game and he cared about the game. Uh, and um, but at one point, uh, I said to him that I had been a party at a party with Jonathan Alter, the writer, mm -hmm. and Alter had asked me if I had writ read Obama's book Dreams uh, uh, from My Father, and I said no, I had read his second book, which is sort of a campaign book. And he said, you've got to read Dreams from My Father. And so um, uh, I said, uh, well, okay, I, I will read it. And I read it, and now I'm telling Obama this. And I said, like everybody else, I said, oh, and, and Alter had said it was just beautifully written, just a terrific book. And um, he also said that, um, that when he saw Obama, he told Obama that the book was a beautiful book, beautifully written. And Jonathan Alter said, but you're ruining it for the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> that we weren't be able, that all, all right. the other journalists weren't be able to, to get to that level of, of his writing. But like a lot of people, and I told this to Obama, I said, I wondered if you actually wrote it yourself. <clears throat> so I said, at the end of the book, you uh, have an acknowledgement. And one of the acknowledgements was to an, one of your editors, Ruth Fesich, mm -hmm. F-E-C-Y-C-H. And Ruth edited three of my books. And I knew that if I called Ruth, now I'm telling Obama this. Right. I said, now if I, if I called Ruth She'll give and, you I, and I asked her, she, she would give me, she would tell me the truth. Right. So I called her up. I said, Ruth, I said, did Obama really write that book himself? It was gorgeously written. It was terrific. She said yes. And now I'm telling Obama, but I'm relating my conversation right. with Ruth Fesich. 
And I said, that son of a bitch. <laughs> and, uh, and I was just relating my conversation with Ruth, and she laughed. I mean, he laughed. And uh, uh, so that was, um, that was, and. Uh, yeah. Uh, what was it that you, uh, he, he had complimented you on something, and you said, I'll get you an autograph copy, and, yeah. and he's, tell us. Well, that well, I had, um, I, when I met him, he said, uh, you wrote the book with Clyde. I had written a book called Rock and Steady with Walt Frazier. Right. So he's then the star of the Knicks, 1974, 75. And uh, it was an unusual kind of book. <clears throat> and it got a lot of awards. And, it was, mm -hmm. and um, so uh, he said, you wrote the book with Clyde. Not Walt Frazier, but I mean, he was very knowledgeable yeah. basketball. You know, Clyde. I said, well, yeah. He said, you know, catching flies and the, the and his wardrobe. And I said, because uh, his hands were so fast, he said he could catch, catch flies. Catch flies out yeah. of the air. So yeah. and we had uh, diagrams of how to catch flies when the fly is on the ground or when the fly is flying. <laughs> it was anyway. It was an unusual book. So I said, uh, I said, yeah, I, that book was written a long time ago. Uh, how how do you know about this book? He said, I bought it when I was 12 years old. Wow. Yeah. So. Uh, and uh, oh, and then I, um, I said to him, "Well, were you, was Walt Frazier a, uh, an idol for you? I mean, did you model your basketball game uh, on, on, on Walt Frazier?" He said, "No." He said, uh, "I said he said I was lefty, and Lenny Wilkins was oh, my yeah. was my idol, yeah. and I modeled my game after Lenny Wilkins." And so I said, "Well." Um, I was going to do a magazine. I went to do a magazine story on Lenny Wilkins, but before when he was a coach of Seattle, and before leaving, I saw Frazier, and I said, "Clyde, do you have a question for Lenny Wilkins?" And I'm going to go see him. And he said, "Yeah." He said, "Ask him this. Ask him. I, I always knew he was going left, but I couldn't stop him. Ask him why." <laughs> so now I'm telling Obama this. So, uh, uh, and what did he say? So Obama said. So I. I said to Lenny Wilkins that uh, Frazier said that he always knew you were going left, but he couldn't stop you. Why? And Lenny Wilkins said, he always knew I was going left, but he never knew when. <laughs> Obama said, that's like me. That's what I play with these guys. They know I'm going left, but they never know when. <laughs> so he was equating himself with Lenny Wilkins, the Hall of Fame basketball player. Okay. I want to talk a little bit about your background and your, your, I mean, I called your writing luminous and that's probably not even a, the, doing it the justice it deserves. But you have a painter's sensibility and you, 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 you did have a, 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 a scholarship to the Chicago Institute of Art and might have been a painter in, in a, things had worked out differently. And I'm fascinated by a story also in the book about how you, um, Winston Churchill was a model or taught you something from a book you picked up in a bookstore. Yeah, in the, the, at the Strand actually, you know, in New York. Uh, yeah. It was called Painting as a Pastime and it was like a long magazine story but put into a book by Winston Churchill and about how he learned to paint when he was uh, fired from the Admiralty and, and he was out and he, and he needed a hobby and began painting. And he, and he said that before he began painting, he never noticed the shadows on buildings. Hmm. And, and that heightened... The play of light. Yeah, and, and, but it's also see, you know, seeing every, everyday things, you know, but seeing them new. And, and that enhanced my uh, reporting uh, and my writing. I mean, I would go, I would go to a game and, uh, uh, and I would see the shadows on, build, uh, on, on, uh, on the field and, uh, and the movements and so forth. And so see the way the flags were, 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 uh, were flying and um, how the wind was blowing. But you, these are the things that, and then I would, I would go uh, to museums and study what painters saw. You know, why did uh, Van Gogh 
Van Gogh. Gogh. <laughs> and, 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 uh, I mean, why did, what did he see why, and, and how did he see it and why did it interest him? You know, and I, I would do that. I would, and Rembrandt. Rembrandt. I went to the Cleveland Museum He once. played second, but no, never mind. Yeah, he was. <laughs> and there was a painting of an old man. And you saw the, uh, the uh, veins on the old man's hand. Uh, and you saw it from a little distance, the veins on the old man's hand. Then you got up closer, and it was just a brushstroke, just little mm. brushstrokes. And it was the brushstrokes that told the full story. Less is more. Yeah, less is more. And if I could find those brushstrokes in those movements, I didn't have to illuminate everything, you know, say everything, and, um, and, and the reader could get it, you know. And so anyway, I studied these, whether it worked or not for me, but those were my influences. And so I, write, I wrote a piece uh, uh, for a periodical, and it was called um, Painting with Words, yes. which you re referred to. Yeah. And... Um, uh, and Hemingway, I, I, I discovered, did similarly to what, to what I did. He would go to museums, too, and, and do this, the same kind of thing. Um, and uh, I, I, when I was in grade, in grade school, I got a scholarship to the uh, Art Institute of Chicago, and, um, and they had me drawing models and stuff. And uh, I just wasn't altogether interested in that, especially now I had found baseball. <laughs> so Exactly. Um, the, the piece you're referring to, which is in the book, uh, has a lovely uh, uh, amplification of what you're talking about with a most unusual character, Rocky Graziano. You, oh, Rocky. Uh, you know, I'm asking yeah. you to remember stuff you've written yeah, a couple yeah, of no, years no, ago. Yeah, no, 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 I remember. No, Rocky, Rocky liked to paint by the numbers. There was some kind of thing, which I don't the, even know. The heavyweight fighter, right? It was the middleweight, the middleweight, middleweight, middleweight champion, and they made that wonderful movie, Somebody Up There Likes Me, starring, the first starring role, Paul Newman. Really? His first starring role okay. was, was Rocky Graziano. And, and Paul Some, Newman. Somebody Up There Likes Me. And uh, Rocky, pa uh, Rocky painted. Yeah, Rocky painted, but he would paint by the numbers. I guess they would say, okay, now, uh, uh, and, and there were, there were, he would paint the masterpieces, uh, but it was like uh, yeah. uh, number seven, you paint green here right. or something. Anyway, and, uh, and so I did an interview with him about his painting. And uh, I said, uh, well, um, uh, do you know uh, uh, Van Gogh? I don't know the guy, but he's a great painter. <laughs> and we, the, the interview went on like this, you know. And, uh, and pretty soon I was almost... I was falling off the chair. My, I was taking notes. In, in those days, we took notes. We didn't right. do the uh, tape recorder. And, and I was having trouble writing <laughs> because my hand was shaking. He was, he was funny. And he, was, he was great. Um, and, uh, but he was a wonderful man. And, uh, um, and, I, and I, I liked him a lot. And he was, and, you know, he, he was a comedian, too. I mean, and, uh, after his boxing career, Martha Ray, the, the, the comedian, had uh, a television show, and he was a, a regular on her show. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if we're talking about painting with words, we probably ought to talk about Red Smith, who was an idol of yours, who was a mentor of yeah. yours, and uh, of whom you wrote a, uh, a biography. Is there a way here in this medium, this is television, the words aren't there, but can you... Can you put Red Smith, can you crystallize him for our audience that, you know, that in, bring him to life so that they want to run out right now and buy something by Red Smith? He also wrote very descriptively. Uh, he could write with passion and, and, uh, uh, and if there was injustice. Um, uh, the, the first, I, I started reading him when I, in Chicago when he was... Um, he was uh, in the Chicago Sun Times. Mm -hmm. He was syndicated across syndicated, the country, yeah. and he was in the Chicago Sun Times. And um, uh, I remember reading him, and just being amazed at how beautiful his stuff was. Um, he he wrote about a um, a an outfielder leaping up to catch a ball, and he said that he hung in the air so long he looked like an empty uniform hanging in a locker. Mm. <laughs> And, um, and about Jackie Robinson uh, making a diving catch. Um, I forget exactly, I, I hate to paraphrase Red Smith, but it was um, the, un, uh, the undefeated doing the impossible, something, yeah. something like that. Well, he was, by more than 
one person he was thought of as the Shakespeare of the the press box. Yeah, um, yeah. Just a remarkable person. Yeah. And I'll, I'll never forget Ira. You know, he was getting on in years, and he had the t column in the Times, and he was writing four columns a week. And they cut him back to three. And he wrote a column, and I think it was on a Monday, it appeared in the Times. He was angry that they cut him back to yeah. three. And the, the, I'll never forget the title of the column and, and the content, but it was writing less and better, question mark. And he was railing against the idea that he needed to break to be cut from four to three. And if I'm not mistaken, it was later that week that he died. Yeah, it was his, it was his last column uh, after uh, a career that began in 19... 27, this was 1982, January of 1982. Yeah. And uh, that was his last column. And, uh, and he was feisty, you know, you know to the end. Uh, it, and that column wasn't all of what he wrote for that column because he was getting sick and he was sending it in by the, with the computer it. and they had, it, he had lost some of it. He had pressed some buttons and he had lost some of that column. So what we all read was maybe two thirds of the column that oh, really? he wrote, and um, well, uh, I think the, uh, I I don't want to sound like the the, the, the all knowing, but I, I think it's fair to say that if you can remember, as I am now remembering and you're remembering, I mean I remember that column. You say it was '82, yeah, and this is 2017. Yeah, I remember that column as if it was yesterday, and. That's when you know you you're reading somebody uh, who's making a difference in your in your life. In right, way. and uh, uh, I got a, I was I was home writing a column on Red Grange, the old football oh, sure. player, and I got a phone call from the sports editor Joe Vecchione. Now, I, when I was in college at Miami of Ohio, and starting to write a column sports column for the school newspaper, I sent my column. I decided I was to send them to Red Smith, who I did not know. And I sent him two of my columns. And then we began a correspondence. So this was 1961. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then I developed a relationship with Red. And, and Red critiqued my stuff and edited some of my stuff. And, and we became friendly. He was very kind about it. Yeah, it was, he, he was great about it. And um, uh, so now uh, I got a call. I'm writing a Red Grange column. I get a call from Joe Vecchio, the sports editor, and said, Ira, I've got some, uh, some difficult news. Uh, Red died. Red Smith died. And um, we have an advance obituary in the paper, <clears throat> but uh, we don't like it. And we'd like you to write the obituary mm. on Red Smith. Yeah. And I said, uh, well... It's my my job. You're asking me to do my job, so I'm I'm going to do the job. This is this is difficult. I, we knew he was sick, <clears throat> but we hoped that he pull through. So um, I uh, I wrote the column, and in it <clears throat> um, I said that he was very generous with advice to college students, and I recalled a letter that he sent to one college student who sent two of his sports columns. I didn't mention my name. And it was, uh, dear uh, uh, to the name, uh, uh, when I was a young reporter uh, with the uh, Milwaukee Sentinel and writing a lead, the um, uh, city editor would come by and look over my shoulder. If he liked what I wrote, he'd nod and walk away. If he didn't, he'd say, try again. My advice to you is try again mm. and again. If what a gentle if, touch. You, if you're for this racket, and not many really are, you'll have an eternity of tears and sweat ahead. Not just you, but anybody. And uh, he said, um, uh, uh, I, would, I was uh, tempted to put in marginal, uh, my, my impulse was to write in marginal criticisms uh, in your columns, but um, I decided not to. And, and uh, so when, when I got this letter from him, uh, 
I wasn't sure, should I be flattered or should I be dismayed? <laughs> dismayed that he didn't like my stuff or flattered that uh, the great man, who, who's then acknowledged as one of the great writers in America, not just sports writers, um, that he took time. Sure. And um, so I decided to be flattered. And Good I took, idea. And I took the two columns, I pasted them up, and I folded them up in an envelope, and I wrote a note. Dear, and he said, he said, I was planning, I, I, my impulse was to write a marginal criticisms, but they wouldn't have made you happy. So I made the, uh, the, the columns, I put them up in, in, in these papers, and I folded it all up, and I wrote a note. And I said, dear Mr. Smith, please make me unhappy. Mm. And he came back, and it was like, like if, you know, a school teacher editing your stuff. Yeah. And I do remember one of the columns I'd said something about the hot corner. Like, and he said, no, no, don't use a cliche like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Brett Smith. Um, I'd be remiss, Ira, if I didn't ask you about your lifelong team, the Chicago Cubs, who are today the defending champions of baseball. Did you ever think you would be able to no, celebrate that day? No. And how did you get through the night back in well, October? Yeah. November, uh, well, well I, I went to... Uh, the first two games in Wrigley Field, uh, I was able to get tickets through the Baseball Writers Association, and uh, and and then I came home and I watched Game Seven, that phenomenal Game Seven yeah. on, on television, and uh, and then they they came back and they won, and I mean after 108 years, but I'd been a fan for almost 70 years, and I'd gone through all the the ups and the downs, and the downs and the downs and the downs. All downs. And, yeah. uh, you know, getting close and getting close. And then it was like, you know, I, I likened it to Sisyphus pushing the, the rock up a mountain, you know, and then he gets to the top of the mountain the, and, the, and, the, 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 and the boulder comes falling back. And uh, so, um, but uh, uh, after that seventh game when they won, and um, I was stunned, really. And there was a, a sense of not so much a great joy but sort of relief in a way and uh and my wife says that that my eyes were kind of teary i don't know i'm not saying that they were not i think but, dolly knows when your eyes yeah, yeah. Are, but your eyes but are <clears throat> so after they won the series i ran into a guy i know and he said you know it's really hard to repeat i said <laughs> i said repeat who the hell cares if they repeat? I don't care if they in last place for the rest of my life. I mean, they, they this they one finally. this one shining moment, you know. Give me uh, thirty seconds. Not fair to put the question that way about the Mets. Are they? What do you think? Uh, as they, the Mets have this great pitching staff. I mean, so much of baseball, of course, is pitching. And if the pitchers stay healthy, uh, they have a chance. You know, I mean, um, you look look. Uh, Two years ago, they wiped out the the, the Cubs in the in, 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 in the, the championship playoffs, series, yeah. and National League championship series, and the Mets went to the World Series. Um, and but they have these pitchers, these terrific pitchers. So, but the Cubs also have some very good pitchers. Yeah, they, do. <laughs> they have a they have a team that looks like it's built for the ages. And uh, yeah, and I and I envy you as a Cubs fan. Yeah. I'm so delighted you spent time with us uh, these past two weeks, Ira. The book is called It Happens Every Spring. It's full of some of the best writing you'll ever find any place. And um, go out there and get it. And maybe he'll even be at some events signing some copies and you'll want to you'll want to go up there and say, sign this for me. Ira, thank you so much. Well, my pleasure, Tony, always. And thank you for watching. We'll see you next week.